Good morning, everybody. This is Michael Darger from the University of Minnesota Extension. And I'm pleased to see so many people here on our early Monday morning. Um, I just want to do an acknowledgement that today is a federally recognized Columbus Day in Minneapolis, where I live. It is uh, only recognized as, indig as Indigenous Peoples Day. So no matter what you're commemorating where you are, it is a day of commemoration. And with that, I will just do a brief land acknowledgement. The University of Minnesota's Twin Cities is built within the traditional homelands of the Dakota people. Minnesota comes from the Dakota name for this region, Minnesota Makoche, the land where the waters reflect the skies. And uh, where John's office is, the University of Minnesota Extension Regional Office, Cloquet, is located within the traditional homelands of the Fond du Lac Band of Ojibwe. And with that, I will introduce John Bennett, my colleague, I'll play technologist, but John Bennett is hosting this session. Great, thanks, Michael. Uh, well, good morning, everyone. Uh, yeah, as Michael mentioned, my name is John Bennett. I'm uh, an extension educator. I do community economics work with University of Minnesota Extension. And uh, yeah, we're sort of restarting up here. Our, we, we, we sort of took the summer off here with our, our webinar series, but uh, we're, we're starting up in the fall here with this will be the first of um, uh, you know more to come, more webinars to come. Um, uh, this is part of our business retention and expansion community of practice series. So many of you who are on the call may have done some some type of work with us in the past on business retention and expansion, or uh, you made it onto our our, our list uh, our list somehow. So welcome. We're we're really glad you're here. And today. Um, we're going to be having a conversation and hearing from um, our friend and colleague, John Kymig. John is with the University of St. Thomas um, a Family Business Center. And a lot of the, the topics and subjects that we've talked about over the last couple of years with this series is related to business succession. And um, But one thing that we have not done is sort of focused in on the, the family side of business succession. We know that um, family-owned businesses, the, the process, you know, through going through transition um, is oftentimes very different than it is for, uh, for other businesses in Minnesota. So we asked John to come here and talk to us a little bit about, um, about the, the things that he's working on with his center and, and the kind of work that they do. So um, with that, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask John Hi, Meg. John, would you mind sharing your, your screen, your presentation with us? And feel free to, to take it away um, in just a minute here. First of all, I just want to say that we're probably going to go about 20 to 25 minutes here for this presentation, and we'll be having questions uh, after that. So please feel free to put your questions in the chat or save them um, save them for the Q&A period, which should come in about 25 minutes or so. So with that, uh, John, I'm going to pass it over to you and, and feel free to take it away. Great. Thank you, John and Michael. Uh, my name is John Keimig. I am the director of the Family Business Center here at the University of St. Thomas. It's a pleasure to work with uh, you guys at the U and with all the outreach you're doing um, in broader Minnesota, where um, there are a ton of family businesses. So thank you for having me. Um, I've been the director here for five years, and I've been at St. Thomas uh, for eight, which was when I was first introduced to this concept of family business education. So briefly about the center, uh, this is our 30th year of educating business families. We serve families from you know, any sort of industry. Uh, we have one family in our center that's been around longer than Minnesota has been, and then we've got other families that have just kind of brought, brought themselves together to, to work together and learn how to do that. Um, in, a, in an average year, we get about 150 family businesses that attend our programming. Uh, the commonality with our families is that most of them have a couple of family members that are working together. And a lot of them are thinking about this transition or maybe just came out of a transition and they're using our center as a place to kind of hold conversations. Uh, less than half of the families that attend have any sort of affiliation with St. Thomas other than the Family Business Center. So we're very open um, to anybody that would like to, to try us out. We do breakfast events, full day seminars, 
and we have five different peer groups um, for executives, next generation members, and women in family business. We also do advisor education um, for accountants, attorneys, those folks that do the work of supporting family businesses. So what we'll cover today is a little bit of a background on family business. And um, there's a model called a three circle model of family business. I'll go through that and how you can apply that to a family business's future. And then we'll take a look at how to, how to get the next generation ready for leadership and how to get the next generation ready for ownership, which is, is those are conversations, the ownership one, especially that most family businesses don't have. Kind of always thinking about the business and the family, but what do we really do with this ownership piece? What does that look like? Who can become an owner? Um, what does it mean to be an owner? So I want to highlight a little bit of that. Um, so those conversations can come back to other communities across Minnesota. And then what can be done um, as we're looking at, at transitions around the state. So a little bit of background on family business. Uh, they account for 87% of American companies and employ almost 60% of the private sector workforce. So those of you that are here from different counties across the state that are you know, representing um, workforce development, majority of your companies in your area are going to be family businesses. And generally, only about a third of them successfully transition each generation. But 90% uh, of those who adequately prepare um, do transition successfully to the next generation. So we really need to start having conversations in family business about how to get ready and then to understand um, the tactical side of that as well. But really have the, have the conversations, the communication within the family, and then find the right people that can help you um, from outside the family. And here's a little cartoon I like to share. Eventually, son, you'll be in charge of all of this, assuming, of course, that I can't come up with any better alternative. And I think that just goes back to the idea of how do we really get our next generation interested, get them the skills they need, and to have conversations that are not like this. Um, how do we really get, get things going to that next generation? Here's a little bit of differences between family and non-family businesses. Uh, the average uh, family business CEO is in that position for about 18 years versus publicly com publicly traded, which can be about four to six. So you think about the leadership transition that happens every time you hear Target has a new CEO, you know, within a year, it feels like there's a brand new C-suite. And then what happens as that goes through the organization? So in a family business, you have this, this ability to have uh, employees there for a really long time. Um, an old article showed that uh, more than three quarters of public CFOs would make decisions that destroy value to meet quarterly earnings. Family businesses, they're looking at next generation, not the next quarter. So you, you have this ability to just really focus on, on what's important long term and, and ride through some of the tougher waves. Um, family businesses are more nimble. Uh, they make quicker decisions, much fewer owners that need to be satisfied. And one thing I love is that um, the Edelman Trust is an organization that does research on this, and their last version, I think, came out in 2019. People trust family businesses significantly more than publicly held. So it's not just this idea that, um, that family businesses can last longer and typically do, but the, the public wants to, to work with family businesses because they trust them more. So here's this, this three-circle model. It's very plain but there's a lot to it. And when you look at, at what happens over time, when a family business starts, which is typically the entrepreneur comes up with an idea and maybe there's an employee or maybe not, there, these three circles are all slammed together and all the decisions are made kind of in one, one area by one person. What happens over time is they start to pull apart a little bit. And that founder, CEO, or whoever's in charge of the business usually sits right in the middle of that number four area. So oftentimes this is mom or dad or both, and they're part of the family, they're part of the management, and they're the owners. And what happens with their kids over time is their kids grow up in that number one circle of just being part of the family. And then they transition some of them into the business or into the management. And so this is really important because everybody in these different circles comes to the conversation, comes to the business, to the family with a different set of experiences and expectations based on where they are. Um, oftentimes there's a, a sibling that has no interest in being in the family business. And so they just kind of stay in this family circle. 
But over time, uh, these three areas, these overlaps of the family are ones where family businesses really need to pay a lot of attention. Because what happens when mom and dad look to retire? As they leave the management or the business, they could transition just back to the family circle, or they could keep some ownership. What does that mean as other kids move from maybe number three to number four, and now they're making ownership decisions with parents who are no longer involved in the day-to-day -day of the business? Um, and then what do we do with this child? Does this child who maybe was a school teacher or a nurse, which seems like it's always one of those two that doesn't want to enter the business, um, do they get ownership? Do they move into here as somebody who's not part of the business? Um, and that, that can be tricky conversations with family. Best practice is that ownership stays within the family members employed in the business. Um, but we have a lot of family businesses in our center that completely disagree with that because their owners are educated to be owners and they bring value to the family business, even though they have a pay, they get their paycheck outside of the family business. So this is a model that um, is really important for family businesses to understand and to plot their family and their key employees and understand how people can move back and forth. A couple of these other circles down here, you know, number seven is just kind of those key uh, employees that are just in the management, not part of the family, not part of ownership. I don't see a lot of outside capital coming into this number five circle where there's no relation to the family or the business. And once in a while, this number six is kind of a key employee that gets some ownership. Um, and so that's, that's this three circle model of family business. And how do we use that to look to a family's future? So we come back to this and we actually write down the names of those people. So this is an exercise that, that business owners can do and advisors can work with, with family business clients on this, or you can do this in your community, is to help families plot their family business in these circles, put the, all the family members, key management people, owners, and put them where they are um, and really pay attention to the overlaps and make sure that the right people are in those overlaps. And what you can do with, with this is then what's called a 5, 10, 15 exercise, where you're going to list your name, your spouse's name, your sibling's name, whoever it is that's in the business, your children's names, key leaders' names, and write down their age. And you take a couple minutes and you work some simple math and you say, all right, their age plus five, plus 10, and plus 15. And what family businesses realize is, you know, when mom or dad are, you know, 70, 71, 72 years old, five years is not that far away. And so it can help um, family businesses realize, oh my gosh, I don't want to be doing this when I'm 75. And I have other goals and dreams and aspirations. And so what you try to do is, is plot that out for each of these key people in the family and the business, and also ask those questions too, um, or figure out the assumptions of, do they want to be in this business in X amount of time? If not, how do we replace them? Are one of these people the leader of our ownership group? How do we find somebody else that can step up? What are their goals? Does this child have any interest in coming into the business? Um, and what age are they now? You know, if this child is 22, it's going to be a number of years before they might be ready for a leadership position. So how do we find those key non-family people that can keep the business side moving and, and have that relationship that mentors that next generation? So combining the, the three circle model with this 5, 10, 15 exercise can really help a family business look to its future and understand the key people involved um, and where gaps might come up and what, what we can do to start planning for those gaps now. We did this exercise with um, some families in our center. And when they came to, back to report after having a meeting on this, uh, one gentleman said, thank you for this. I just found my retirement date and it's one year from this date in November. And I said, well, how'd you do that? Well, I just said, decided to do plus one and I realized I was too old. I didn't want to be in the business anymore. So I gave myself one year. And so this was an aha moment for him to say, I, there's no way I can be doing this in five years. Um, and that helped him figure out, okay, I, I'm, I've got a one year runway here um, left in the business. And then 
had that conversation with family so they all knew what what the expectation was i want to take a little bit of a look at uh the business side of of transitions there are seven stages of successor leadership so this kind of dials back all the way to when a, a family member is born and and having conversations at the dinner table bringing them into the office on the weekends I, there are so many family businesses where you ask the child, uh, you know, the next generation person, how'd you start in the business? And the answer is cleaning the shop floor as a teenager. And so this is how you start to um, show values, the family values in the business and get those people ready to make a decision, that next generation, to see if they e even have any interest in being in the business. And so by bringing them along and, and bringing them in um, at an early age, they start to see work ethic and they start to see the importance of the family business in the community. The 20 to 30 year old age is when they enter the family business. Sometimes they, they enter, some families say, you know what, I'm gonna create a position for you, not advised. Other families say, you gotta wait till there's an open position where your skill set meets it. Some families have an education requirement. Some families say you gotta go work somewhere else for a couple of years. Um, but whatever that is, this is kind of the age where most people will enter the family business either coming in fresh and just a real desire to be in the family business or bringing in some outside skills. The next uh, grouping is, is really the business development. How do we learn how to be a good employee? How do we learn about the business? How do we learn about all of these different areas of the business? And then as the transition starts approaching, we need to start putting that next generation um, into leadership development groups. So how do you lead a portion of the organization. Sometimes that's starting something new, kind of a startup within the family business or opening up a new avenue for innovation. Um, but other times it's, you know, maybe 20 hours a week, they're working as the director of marketing and the other 20 hours a week, they're starting to take on general business that they can be mentored by the senior generation. What happens next is the family kind of selects who the future leaders are, does the transition. And then once they're 45 or older, um, you know, their next generation has, should be going through some of that attitude preparation as well. And ideally, if the family wants to keep the business um, as part of its family, um, this cycle will just repeat itself. And so for the older generation, it's really important to have conversations with the family about what your goals are for the family business. Why did you start this family business? What are the values around starting the family business? And what do you hope your legacy is? Because you're going to have a legacy. It's just a matter of if you want it to be a certain legacy. So what do you want this business to be in 5, 10, 20, 100 years? And it doesn't mean it has to be this you know, huge entity, but what do you want your legacy to be? Because then the next generation can start to understand everything that, that the founding generation or the generations before put into it and why. And so you can align the family with its history. Um, the older generation should also recognize and acknowledge accomplishments in the next generation, which sometimes is really hard um, for parents to really pull up their kids um, and, and congratulate them. Um, it's also important that families, the older generation, pays attention to its interactions with the next generation and particularly their spouses. So family business, when done well, can be just an awesome thing for families to really unite around, but um, when done poorly can tear families apart. And so it's really important that, that as, as you're bringing the next generation along and asking for their input, um, that you're listening to it because chances are that child will go back and talk with their spouse and their spouse will take their side and you can start to have conflict from outside of the bloodlines of the family and you, you don't want that. Um, and then give successors jobs that increase in responsibility as their abilities grow. So as they start to get better in certain areas, start to give them more to do so one day they can take over the business. Some coaching techniques for parents. Don't step in right away and fix a problem. Find a time um, away from the rest of the employees to talk about it. Um, set regular meetings. Oftentimes, um, you'll see a, a parent child that'll do a weekly lunch where they're going to um, talk about um, problems and, and progress. Um, and, and keep in mind that, that great leaders are known more by the success of their followers 
than what they do themselves. So really, it's in the best interest of, of the operating generation to get the next generation ready. Um, and that's where that's where your legacy is really gonna, uh, gonna shine through. So some leadership skills here on your screen for the next generation um, to understand, you know, most things have been built for them. So they're gonna have to learn how to create a culture, how to build a team. Oftentimes, you know, that, that, that owner has got a couple of key employees, that main CEO in the business that are probably about the same age. And so when the next generation comes up into the business, they're likely going to have to start building their own team. And so you'll hear this from non-family people that say, you know what, when, when you retire, I'm retiring too. And so they're really tied to that CEO, that leader of the organization. And so you might lose a lot of people when mom, dad retire. Um, the last bullet here, family communication. It gets really hard when you have siblings um, in the business as well, or cousins. Um, and siblings and cousins that might be owners or prospective owners not in the business. So it's a great idea to, to learn to communicate as family, to learn to communicate as a business, and to learn to communicate as owners. And one thing we tell families is to actually go into a conversation and, um, and say, I'm talking to you as a member of the business right now. I'm talking to you as a fellow owner. I'm talking to you as a family member and to separate family, business, and ownership, those three circles and say, this is what we're talking about right now. And these are the conversations that we need to have. So uh, a little bit about ownership and what that means. Again, most family businesses that, that we talk with, um, kind of ownership just is this thing that, that happens because somebody started the business. And it can start to get messy and lead to problems that typically, you know, play out in the newspapers and the courts because they always play out at the same time that way, unfortunately. Um, and they're usually around ownership issues. So I want to go over some different aspects of ownerships. You have operating owners. Those are the people that work in the business. So back to that three circle model. Um, those are the folks that that are in the, in the family, the business and the ownership um, or at least the, the business and the ownership. An active owner is somebody that is involved in the family business, but is not part of the business. So sometimes this could be a board member. This could be a family member um, that is does something else in the community, but shows up at family business events that are in the community. Maybe there's a fundraiser that the family business does. Um, and so these people are, are active out there. They really care about the family business. They're just not there in the day to day. The passive owner is somebody that um, just says, hey, how's the company doing? You know, where's my kickback? I, I have an expectation to, to get money out of this. And then the investor is that, that person that's not part of the family um, or the business that is just contributing resources financially and expects a return, which is likely a lot different than the expected return of the family. So what does ownership do? They decide everything from what business to be in. Do we want to continue to be a construction company? Do we want to you know, pivot to renewable energy? Um, what is it that we want to be in? Owners get to decide that. They get to decide what sort of returns, if any, the family should expect, what sort of risk the family takes on, um, how, how to make the, the family business liquid if they want to get out of it, buy sell agreements with each other and how to transition plan. So um, there's a lot that, that needs to be thought about and discussed. And that's why it's important for owners to be educated so they don't become the passive owner that just says, where are my dividends? Because what happens a generation from then is that that person's kids will have really hardly any connection to the family business and will just repeat the same things that mom or dad did of where are my dividends? And then you start to really probably try to get into some buy sell agreements to buy those people out. So the people that are more passionate about the family business are the ones that are owning it. And the role of owners is really to um, understand the business, the strategy, what's going on at a high level. Um, keep the family values alive, uh, maintain close relationships with other owners. 
and support development of the next generation. You know, I mentioned earlier that family business when done well can be a really great thing for a family. I don't come from a family business. I don't have these connections with my family around this central entity that pulls us together. So you can really have great relationships with other family members because you have this family business. Um, you can sit on the board or participate in a family foundation or community outreach. So there's a lot that owners can do and, and should be expected to do um, to, to really perpetuate the family business. For uh, transition planning, you should really start at least five years ahead of a planned exit to really start having these conversations and involve family members in those discussions. Being an entrepreneur, they say, is a very lonely place. I, I would say being an entrepreneur in a family business is even lonelier um, because very often you see family business leaders that have no one to talk to about this stuff. And so they just kind of plan things in their head and kick things down the road. And so to have conversations with family, hey, I'm thinking about exiting the business. None of you work here. I'm just letting you know, can often lead to, hey, mom, dad, you never invited us to come into the business. And we've been waiting on the sidelines for that to happen. And now we're ready. Um, so please don't sell it. We want to buy it from you or transition it to us, however that looks. So really have those conversations ahead of a transition because you're not, you never really know what your family might think of it. And if, if they grew up in the business coming in on the weekends and they respect your work ethic, there's probably part of them that, that looks at it and goes, you know, this is something that's really cool. Or maybe it's a pillar community business that employs a lot of people. And, and that next generation, they don't care so much about the, the widgets that you're making, but they care about those values of being that, that community business and that large employer. Um, Really important to showcase what that next generation brings so they can be a trusted leader uh, within the employees that are there. Again, talk openly about future plans and get outside help. Um, that can be anybody like a peer group, um, networking just with other owners at different um, chamber of commerce type events, things like that. Um, or it's bringing in specific family business advisors um, to help uh, transition the you know, the ownership piece, the transition, the, the leadership piece, whatever it is where your family has a pain point, um, there is typically outside help that's available for that. So around Minnesota, I think what can be done is, is to try and create family business gathering events. So our center, we get about 200 people that show up at our breakfast events, and they're all members of family businesses. I used to think they came because we put on great topics for them, and I think we do, but I later learned that they're coming because they want to learn from each other. And so when you get these people in a room together where they don't feel like they're alone, they can start sharing stories of success and some of their issues. And from that, we take that and create new programs based on what the pain points are. But this can be replicated anywhere as long as people are willing to come in and have conversations and try to learn from each other. We also do peer groups, which I think, you know, Vistage, CEO Roundtable, there's a lot of organizations out there that do them. Um, there are different ones in the manufacturing sector, but, um, you know, a lot of different sectors have them. But to bring people together to start talking about um, whatever the issues are within their family business can be really helpful to get each other through that. Um, help owners discover their goals for the business. Again, what, what is your legacy, your desire for a legacy? What do you want to see out of this? Because that can really help, you know, if it's really this owner wants a retirement home in Florida, okay, they're looking at, at a financial exit. If this owner says, you know, I have no next generation, but I hope this business stays in this community for a long time. You know, maybe it's connecting them with Sue Crockett at the, uh, the Minnesota Center for Employee Ownership to look at that sort of option um, to keep that business in, in the community. Um, business owners are good at running the business. They can set a vision, a strategy, they execute, but they need to do that on the family and the ownership side too. So they've got the skills and, and the understanding of what needs to happen, but how do we take that out of the business and put it onto the business as well. Um, again, point families to appropriate resources, um, convince families to start transition planning now, start having these conversations now. There's a difference between succession planning and transition planning. Transition planning is the event. That's when mom, dad, leave the business, leave the ownership, whatever it is that that looks like, 
succession planning is how do we build this for the future? So it's just this thing that keeps happening. And that includes everything from buy sell agreements to um, having a, a being ready for the transition. Um, it's how does somebody enter the business, a family member? What are the stipulations we put on that? Do we want to put an exit plan on there? Um, what does it mean to be an owner? Do you have to work there? How do you acquire ownership? How do you get out of ownership? All of those things are part of succession planning. The transition is when the event happens. Um, and the other thing, I think, stay connected with U of M. These guys do a great job of bringing programming around the state. And I know we're working on some stuff and, and John kind of mentioned it is that we're, we're trying to really work with all these different entities to, to put resources out there for, um, for all business owners. And I think the U of M extension does a great job of really spearheading that. I wanted to show just a little bit of what we do for family businesses. So um, these are the topics we do this year and our families really guide what we, what we do for topics. And so our next events in a couple of weeks, we're doing it on using your family's values for business gain. And then we're doing two virtual events um, on Zoom. Uh, like these guys, we've done a lot of Zoom lately. We did 26 events last year and I was kind of cashed out of them. Um, but our families said, hey, you know what? That actually worked pretty well. So we're doing two events um, when nobody wants to drive in in, in the snow. Um, and so one's on finding and keeping key non-family employees working on a joint program with UW Madison's Family Business Center. And I will say, go Gophers. We're just working on this one thing together. So we're going we're gonna to stick to the U of M pride. Um, and then in February, uh, in the spring, we're going to come back and talk about rights and responsibilities of owners, improving relationships and family readiness for transitions. And these events, we have a membership for families that can attend. Um, otherwise, you can pick them a la carte. And we don't charge a family the first time they come to an event. So if you're working with a family business and one of these topics make a lot of sense for a family you're working with, just connect them with me and there's no charge for them to come check us out. And if they come one time and eat our delicious bacon and never come back, um, that's a win in my book because they're having some conversations within their family. That's what I've got. So I guess, John, I'll turn it back to you. Um, yeah. Stop sharing here and we can get Great. to some Q&A. Well, yeah, thanks, John. I, I, I appreciate that. Um, no offense about the UW system. Our, our friends in Madison, uh, they're good friends of ours, uh, you know, part particularly with the extension folks over there. So, so that's great. Well, thank you very much. I, I appreciate it. Uh, we do have a few questions here. And so I'm going to scroll up a little bit. Um, okay. Uh, Peter Moyer asks, are there standard tools or surveys like the Myers-Briggs or Clifton Strengths that work well for the selection process? How do you take inventory of the next generation's personality traits and skill sets to determine who will be the best fit for a particular role? Any insights on that, John, from your... your yeah, we, we use Myers-Briggs when we teach a course on family governance, which is really how do we communicate across family business and ownership. So we do Myers-Briggs a lot. A lot of people have done that in the past. There's another one called the Colby assessment. Um, I won't go into that, but that that's a good assessment too. And it's about gut instinct and how people react in different situations. It's K-O-L-B-E. Um, obviously strengths finder is a good one too. We don't do a ton of bringing these in because so many businesses have done them on their own. Um, but the Myers Briggs ones, when you're looking at family interactions and family engagements, you really start to, um, to see, Hey, this is how mom and dad act in a certain way, how my brother or sister acts. Now I can reframe things a little bit when I go to them and I understand why they don't speak up in a meeting. It's because I dominate the meeting because I'm an extrovert and they're an introvert and I need to give them a half hour to think about it. And they're typically as an extrovert, I know um, the introvert's going to come up with an idea that's often way better than what we blurt out as extroverts right away. Yeah, right. Okay. Thanks, John. Uh, the next question is uh, what's the range of ages of departing family business leaders that you see? And what is the age, uh, what's the range of ages coming from, uh, from incoming business leaders from the family? And maybe what's the, the median age you're seeing for each sure. group? So you got it from all, all angles there, John. <laughs> what do you think? 
Yeah, I think, you know, the the exit age on average appears to skew older than general business retirement, um, especially with the founders. It's often a challenge for founders to exit the business because they have no idea what they're going to do next. And so when when that business founder has put in 60, 70 hours, you know, of their a week of their life to this thing, they don't know what to transition to next. And because oftentimes they haven't had anything else. They're not, you know, in a sports league or a golf league or whatever. They just, it's never been part of it. And so that's a real challenge is kind of that last stage of entrepreneurship. Oftentimes what families do to, to get around that when the next generation is ready is, is let's say, let's say dad started a manufacturing business in his garage and now his daughter is going to take over the company and dad doesn't know what to do next. Well, maybe dad goes back to R and D. Maybe there's a role within the business. That's really dad's passion. And then he can step aside and let his daughter grow the company um, and, and really manage the business. So he's still got something to do. You start to see where families oftentimes um, that kind of older generation will start coming in less or have specific roles. Um, and, and that can be a really good thing as long as everybody knows what's going on, because sometimes what happens is somebody comes into the office once a week, calls some key clients, feels important about it, and then um, comes in the next week to, you know, voicemails back from those key people. And I've heard that as a pain point. So really try to structure it and, and make sure that they're doing um, what's needed for the family business. Um, as far as ages coming into the business, it's really business dependent. Some families say, you know, as soon as you're done with high school, we have jobs as delivery people or installers. And so there's a job for you without a college degree needed. Um, we had one family business that took a very different approach to that and said, you know, it's three brothers that own the company. And they said, in order for the next generation to be applied to invite or to be invited to apply for an open position. So right there, they're stating there has to be an open position and you have to be invited to apply. You needed a college degree, five years experience, or three years with a promotion. And one of your uncles had to invite you to apply for that, not your father. So, it, I mean, it's really like to the nth degree, but it makes you think about why does a family set up that way? Because they are a business first family business and they want to make sure that the business is more important than a family member having a job there. So some situations, it starts coming in later, but I think a lot of times what I'm seeing is those family members, it's pretty split, those that kind of come to work out of college and then those that might come in in their 30s and bring in 10 years of experience doing financials or whatever it is, and that can be a benefit to the family business. Great. Thanks. Thanks, John. Uh, people can also raise their hand if they have a question too, and if you want me to, to call on you. Uh, the next question is, uh, does St. Thomas offer services to ecosystem members like economic develop developers, CPAs, lawyers, or, or other advisors? Yes, um, we do an event three times a year called our advisor engagement luncheon. And um, we've kind of paused that for the most part right now. Um, it didn't translate to Zoom very well, um, but my hope is to get that going again in the spring. And we do topics that... Um, that are related to the advisor community, all those people you mentioned, um, and also brings them together so they can start networking and learn what's going on in each other's practice and how to, how to connect and bring the right, the right uh, family business advisors to their clients. Great, thank you. Uh, it looks like our final question here is from, um, from Sandy Voigt. Uh, is there data on how many companies successfully transition from one to two, two to three, three, uh, three plus? There is. And I, I skimmed over it briefly earlier on. And the reason I briefly skimmed over it is because the data says that 33% of companies success, family businesses transition the next generation, 12% to the third and 4% to the fourth. That data was gathered in the mid eighties by only surveying manufacturing companies in the state of Illinois. Unfortunately, it's really hard to find this data um, because when a family business goes away, it's like, how do you really track them down? Um, and with, you know, almost 90% of companies being family businesses. So that's the general data that's out there, that it's about a third, a third, a third, and, and each time a third don't survive. But also if a family business sold, then they didn't count as successfully transitioning when 
in actuality, a sale could be a great transition um, for a family business, any any sort of business. You know, if there is no next generation or there's just an opportunity to sell to employees or whatever it is. So, so John, I wanted to thank you for taking some time today and um, telling us, you know, a lot of great information about family owned businesses and, and also certainly where folks in Minnesota can kind of turn to here if they, you know, want to get, want to get involved with your center and, and those very important discussions that, that are happening as well. So thanks very much for, for taking some time today, John. Thank you. And I just want to jump in and encourage people to do the evaluation about this event, but also to give us ideas for future BRE uh, webinar topics in general, but also specifically about business succession and transition. We are talking to each other across, you know, different groups and state agencies and, and you know, uh, private centers who are working on this issue and it's like an ecosystem. So uh, we're all in this together. So please give us your feedback and your ideas. And the link is in the chat. Great, Michael took the, the words right out of my mouth here. So <laughs> that's, uh, that's great. Uh, yeah, so stay tuned, folks. Um, we will, uh, we'll, we'll let you know what our, our, next, what our we next webinar is gonna be coming up here and we hope to see you then. So with that, uh, thanks again, John, and hope everyone else has a great day.